Hey everyone, it's Anthony. Hope everyone's been doing well. Today we'll be continuing our study of the life of David, and we'll be in 1 Samuel 23, verses 19 through 29. Right? We're not going to review because you can just go back and watch the last lesson in this series. So we're just going to get right into it. So again, 1 Samuel chapter 20, 23, picking up in verse 19. Here we go. All right. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh, on the hill of Achilah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him to the king's hand. All right? So right off the bat, we see these people called the Ziphites, basically riding David out to Saul from where he is. So first question, who are the Ziphites? All right, now your first blank. The Ziphites were Hebrews from the tribe of Judah. The Ziphites were Hebrews from the tribe of Judah. All right, and if you don't remember, David is also from the tribe of Judah. All right, again, the Ziphites are Hebrews from the tribe of Judah. All right, and they are from the town of Ziph, which is why they're called Ziphites. All right, so now where's Ziph? Your next blank. Ziph was just 17 miles south of David's hometown of Bethlehem. Again, Ziph is just 17 miles south of David's hometown of Bethlehem. All right, so if you're not catching what's going on here, they're cousins, they're David's cousins, and they're pretty close cousins. All right, they're only 17 miles apart. 17 miles is about the distance from Apollo Park in Lancaster to the Finn and Feather Club in Palmdale, that big lake you see off the side of the freeway. Right. So not really far from each other, they're pretty close. All right. And if you're not catching what's going on, we'll reread it, all right? So verse 19, then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah saying, is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh on the hill of Achila, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. All right. So if you're not catching what's going on here, your second blank. David's own relatives are betraying him to Saul. All right. David's own relatives are betraying him to Saul. All right. Which is a big deal. All right. Um, the whole country already knows that Saul wants David dead. All right, the whole country already knows that um, Saul's been hunting David back and forth all across the land. And Saul's demonstrated what happens to people who help David. Was, we see in the last lesson that Saul murdered an entire village of priests and their families because of a lie that they helped David. All right, and now David's own family is in on it. David's own family, his own relatives are betraying him. All right. We see this reflected in a lot of Psalms that David later writes about this period in his life. Um, a lot of Psalms talk about how just alone and isolated and desperate he feels, talking about how um, there's nobody he can trust, basically, how even his own family is against him. All right. This is one of those instances that inspire those psalms. All right? So again, David's own relatives are betraying him to Saul. Now in verse 21, we see Saul's reaction to it. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. All right, give me a break, Saul. All right? We see how warped Saul's mind has become by sin. All right? So we see right here, like, he seems to be convinced that he's the one who's been wronged, right? He's convinced that he's the victim, and he still thinks that he's right with God from the language that he uses here, all right? And none of this is the case, all right? He's the one that's throwing spears at David. He's the one that sent hit men, basically, to David's house, and he's the one who just murdered an entire village of innocent people. All right, he's not the innocent one, and he's definitely not right with God, like he's pretending to be right now. 
Okay, so your third blank, we see how deeply corrupting and convincing sin can be. Again, we see how deeply corrupting and convincing sin can be. So again, back in verse 21. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon and the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. All right. So basically right here, Saul tells the Ziphites to just double check and make sure that David's where they say he is. And then he'll come down to get him. Okay. Verse 25. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told. So he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul, as Saul and his men were closing in on him and his men to capture them. All right. So we see right here, it says that... Um, Saul's on one side of this mountain and David's on the other side of it. Okay. If you look at like a Google Earth um, viewing of what this part of Israel looks like, it's not a mountain. All right. It's a bunch of very small, low rising hills. It looks a lot like the hills up behind the aqueduct. All right. So you can imagine um, an Saul and his entire army just rolling through those hills up behind the aqueduct to search out David. All right, in that kind of terrain, there's not a lot of places to hide. And we see right here that Saul's on one side of a mountain, which is a small hill to us, and David's basically on the other side of the hill. All right, David's this close to being captured, which is your fourth blank. David is on the verge of being captured. Again, David is on the verge of being captured. Again, there's not a lot of places to hide in terrain like this. Um, Saul and his entire army are on one side of this hill, and David's on the other side. Okay. Well, what happens? Verse 27. Then a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. All right. So we see here that Saul became so solely focused on capturing David here to the south of Israel that he left their entire western border with the Philistines, their enemies, completely vulnerable. All right. And undefended. And the Philistines realized this. And they seize the opportunity and they invade and Saul has no choice but to abandon this hunt for David and go respond to the Philistines. Okay. All right. This wasn't dumb luck. This wasn't chance. All right. This is, this is the Lord using the Philistines. This is your next blank. Number five, the Lord used the Philistines, the enemies of his people to save the next anointed king of his people. You know, one more time. The Lord used the Philistines, the enemies of his people, to save the next anointed king of his people. Okay? Verse 28, like it says, Saul returned from pursuing David after... Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place is called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. All right. And we see that David doesn't just wipe the, wipe the sweat from his brow and say, ooh, that was a close one. All right, David realizes 
what the Lord just did for him right here. And in response to it, he writes Psalm 54. So let's turn there and read that really quick. Psalm 54. All right. And we know that David wrote this psalm about this event because it's specifically annotated there right in the beginning. All right. So Psalm 54, verse 1. O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return evil to my enemies, and your faithfulness put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. All right. This is important. Again, like David doesn't just write this off as him getting lucky or him having good luck, right? David realizes what the Lord's done for him here. David realizes that he was on the verge of being captured, that he was this close to being handed over to Saul. And he realizes what the Lord did for him. He realizes that the Lord used the Philistines, their own enemies, to save him, all right? To give him a chance to escape, all right? And what does he do in response to that? He praises God, and he worships God, and he thanks him for it. All right? I don't know. How often do we, like, in our lives, when we think we're having, like, a streak of good luck or good fortune, how often do we stop and realize or even ponder the fact that um, it's God who's in control of everything? All right? How often do you attribute to something good going on in your life as a result of something that you that you did you know either that you worked for it or um you just set all these conditions to ensure your success you know that's not what david's doing here david realizes what the lord just did for him and david praises him for it and that's an example that we should follow all right so application from all of this number one sin convinces you of things that aren't true and leaves you vulnerable to attack Right, figuratively and literally. Again, we saw that Saul's mind is just so far gone and so convinced of all these things that aren't true because of the sin. Again, we see that he's convinced that that he's the one who's been wronged, that he's a victim, that everybody's out to get him. Right, and that's not true. That we will see you'll just read from basically every chapter preceding this of something that he's doing that's evil and wicked in his pursuit of David, all right? And again, we also see just from the words that he uses here that he thinks he's right with God, all right? That's what sin does. Sin makes you think that you're right with God when you're not, okay? And number two, recognize and praise God for the work he does in your life, like David did here. Again, David didn't just write it off as, as good luck or as dumb luck. David knew that the Lord literally just delivered him from one enemy by using another enemy. All right? The Lord can do anything, and the Lord can use anyone. All right? Again, we need to follow, da follow David's example and praise God. All right? Praise God for the work that he does in our lives. All right? So with that, it was a short lesson. The next one, though, is going to be pretty long. All right? So with that, Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for today and for your word and for this part of your word that just reveals more about who you are and um, what you can do and what you do for us. Uh, thank you for this warning and this caution of um, how convincing and corrupting sin can be, how sin can convince us of things that aren't true, and especially how sin can convince us that we're right with you when we're really not. Father, I pray that in those moments that um, you would just break us, that you would reveal to us that we are in sin, that you would reveal to us the things that we're choosing over you and things that we're loving more than you. Father, and also I pray that um, we'd be humble enough 
to realize that everything everything good that's going that happens in our lives every um stroke of quote unquote luck or um or of any success that we think we brought on ourselves that we'd be humble and realize that it's just all you father and that we would worship you and praise you for it as we see david do here in your son's name i pray amen